As we start our service this morning, let me share with you Psalm 91, uh, a, a different version. It says this, The one whose faith is focused on God, who finds his security in him, does not have to live in fear. He is not left untouched by the tempest of this life, and he may be wounded by the onslaughts of evil. But his great God does not leave him to suffer these things alone. The Lord cares for his own and delivers him even in the midst of the conflicts that plague him. If God is truly our God, you do not have to be afraid of the enemies that threatens or the affliction that lays you low. Men all about you may fall, never to rise again. But the Lord is by your side to raise you to your feet and to lead you to ultimate victory. Even the ministering spirits of his, of his invisible world are watching over you. They will not allow anything to hurt you except by God's loving permission and through his eternal concern. Our loving God has promised it. Because my child loves me, I will never let him go. I shall feel the pain of his wounds and bear his hurt and shall transform that which is ugly into that which enriches and blesses. And when he cries out in agony, I shall hear him and answer him. I will be close to him and will deliver him and I will grant him eternal life. Share in this great song, Friends in High Places. everybody. Uh, welcome again. Um, I was going to say it's good to see you in church this morning, but obviously we can't. Uh, that's, that's not true because uh, <clears throat> we're in church, but uh, you're at home watching and uh, uh, you can see us, but we can't see you. And of course, uh, we miss everybody. We miss seeing everybody and communicating and connecting with everybody. Let me just bring you up to date with a couple of things. Um, ministry obviously continues and in a moment we're going to talk to Brad about what's happening with uh, the kitchen and other ministry. Uh, but in two weeks' time, we are going to launch uh, our May mission appeal. That is still going to happen. 
And uh, in two weeks' time, we're privileged to have Reverend Scott Pilgrim, who will be speaking to us. Uh, he'll be pre-recording a message. He lives in Melbourne. Uh, he is the uh, new uh, director for Global Interaction, uh, a friend of mine, and um, he will be talking to us in two weeks' time. Then, at the end of the month, we'll have Gary Moore uh, bringing us some challenges in respect of, of mission. I'd also like to, to mention, um, uh, because it's been difficult for her, Claire Libri's um, brother passed away at the beginning of the week uh, in Queensland, and of course she was unable to go to, uh, to the funeral, but had to, to watch it online, and it's just, uh, we, we reach out to her with our love uh, and support through this particular time of losing her brother. Um, other ministry continues. Uh, can I just also mention again, uh, if you are able to and um, to, to do your offerings, not that we want to make a big thing about that, but if you're able to do that online, that would uh, uh, be appreciated by Sean. If you've got some issues in respect to that, difficulties, I'm sure that Sean can help you out in that particular area. But I want to welcome Brad. Hi, Brad. Thanks, Phil. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank You're doing you. well? Um, Brad, of course, is the manager of our, our uh, Baptist Belmont Community Care. I always call it Baptist, but that's okay. Um, but Brad, part of our, our, our ministry has been, has been the kitchen, what we call our community kitchen. Talk just a bit about that, numbers of meals that we've been doing, and what's been happening the last couple of weeks in particular. Sure. Well, there was some initial concerns that we may have to shut the kitchen down with the COVID-19 situation, yes. as many um, ministries in the community have had to. But uh, we've looked at it, we've cut our numbers down as, as far as those people who are cooking. And right. thanks to the, those regular faithful people like Ray and Rod and Donna from Meals on Wheels who have been uh, coming consistently and uh, preparing meals. So, yes, it's continuing uh, on a takeaway basis. And then at the end of the evening, meals that we have left over, we're delivering those. Okay. Um, so how many, how many meals would we be doing on, on a week and um, how many would we, we be delivering, Brad? Well, there's roughly. approximately, rough, roughly around 50 meals. We're, okay. we're, we're targeting 50 yeah. meals. Uh, I think averaging around 20 to 25 people who are turning up on the night. Some right. new people have actually been coming okay. along. Yep. That's great. Um, we've had some people invite other people yes. along, which has been great. And then at the end of the evening, uh, Rod and Ray and uh, Robert, also okay. take some meals around to yep. people, which has been greatly appreciated. So there's those people who have chosen not to come out, didn't mm. want to risk bringing the family sure. out, and that's fine. And so for those people, Rod and Ray have been taking meals out, and uh, not only to the people who have been regularly coming along, but the, I believe there's some new, new families that they've found as well mm. that they've been able mm. to minister to as well. So if, uh, if someone from our, our church community was aware of a neighbour or a friend or something that was in, in need of a meal, mm -hmm. uh, do you feel we could um, Absolutely. probably meet that need? Definitely. Definitely can. And what would they do? Ring so you? they could contact me. Uh, so the, you can either invite them to come along on the, the Monday evening to pick right. up a hot meal, or if that's not convenient, if they're homebound, they can't get out, invalid, whatever it may be, uh, then we can prepare a meal, we can freeze it, and then during the course of the week, we can arrange to have someone deliver that do meal. That. Okay. Well, that's, that's good to know. Thank mm. you. Um, and just before Easter, uh, we, we, had a, we, we had a fellow um, turn up, homeless guy. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a whole story to that. Share that with us, would you? There is. Well, we've, it's been interesting. Over the last 12 months, there's been a couple of instances of people sleeping on yeah. the property. And... Uh, Last week there was an incident, uh, a, a man, Grant is his name, uh, been sleeping rough for 12 months, mm. don't know his full situation, but he was sleeping under the tree between our property and the service station. Okay. Rowena spotted him there, Ray went and talked to him, and what eventuated was that Rod and Ray uh, bought him a tent, Okay. Bought him a sleeping bag. Right, put the tent up the back of the property. Put the oh, tent there you at go. the back of the property, provided him with coffee and, and meals, and then Ray organised through a local agency to get him a room at the Panorama in Charlestown, which okay. was just wonderful. Okay. And of course, I mean, the, the uh, motels, no doubt, are happy to take folk because mm. the government's paying for that and they've got no other customers. So yeah. That's right. So yeah. this man was just over the moon. We were able to provide him with some yes. accommodation, help him in the interim period, 
and yeah. also give him a whole set of new clothes because okay. all he had was the clothes that were on his oh. back. Yeah. And multiply that many hundreds of times across our, mm -hmm. let alone the country, but across our city. Um, right. And then Friday afternoon, uh, we had another incident. You share oh, that this, with us. This was rather heart-wrenching. I, I turned up in the afternoon and someone pointed out that there was a, a young lady sleeping in a car. Uh, they weren't aware what the situation was, so I just went over quietly and introduced myself. And this young lady, Kelly is her name, uh, she'd been in a, an abusive situation and uh, she's had to leave the home. She stayed in a women's refuge for a short time. Unfortunately, in the women's refuge, her information was stolen, um, credit card information, and she was just in a bad way. She, you know, really sad and and just gut wrenching. You know, listening to a story, and so uh, we organised organised for Ray and Rowena to meet with her, and we've opened up the church toilets. Right. And, and over the next couple of days, we'll work with her to find her accommodation, make sure she's fed, make sure she's safe. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just, just shows that God's bringing people yeah. across our path. Mm -hmm. And this is what our ministry's all about. It's mm -hmm. all, all about helping those people in the community. And, and God's just bringing them to us, mm -hmm. as well as us being able to work through the kitchen mm -hmm. and, and other established ministries. Do you think there's a possibility she might end up at the Panorama as well? Uh, I, I, I don't think she particularly wants to go there. She, oh, okay. So, um, but we'll we'll find yeah, a, yeah, a safe sure. a safe place. Yeah. And it's the weekend too, of course. Which yep. is that's yeah. right. Okay. Um, yeah, that yeah, it's it's exciting, but it's not. Um, it's, mm. it's challenging. Yeah, and it's challenging. Oh, the stories are tough, um, but that's what people are doing. Locally sure. here in Belmont, mm -hmm. um, right on our doorstep. Uh, therefore, um, opportunities coming our way. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm aware that we just, or well, the Lions Club have just received a grant. That's Share right. us a, a bit about that and what that's going to be used for, Brad. Well, as most of the people in the church would be aware, we, we've got a, a short term plan, we've got a long term plan. Yep. Short term plan was to establish the kitchen that's up and running yep. and fortunately continuing. Uh, the next phase was to complete. The food bank and because now we have the government funding of a hundred thousand dollars which is wonderful mm. uh, we can now complete that and as soon as the COVID-19 situation's over we can get that established and up and running because there'll be huge need within the community of people out of work you know pe people needing food and yeah. uh, and other things that we can provide through Good 360 as well um, also most people be aware that it was identified by the local government that there were people sleeping in their cars and we were looking at the opportunity to establish a, um, a block at the back where we had shower, toilet, laundry and parking area for the homeless. So we're currently investigating uh, converting the existing workshops which were originally ladies' toilets yes. and converting that into a shower, toilet, laundry with a little kitchenette. So we're mm. currently looking for quotes for that. And this is coming out of this grant that the last That'll be coming received. out of the grant. Okay. So we've got a, a set amount of money, so we've got to use that wisely. Yeah, sure. And so we'll just need to get some quotes and mm. see what we can do yeah. uh, with the money and the time that yeah. we have. Mm. Yeah, opportunities are, uh, are probably going to be endless. Mm -hmm. Well, not the opportunity. I mean, opportunities to minister to people because the, the issues are going to be pretty tough at the end of this v virus issue. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and we as a church can be and should be prepared to to help however we can and mm -hmm. um, it's great that we can do what we are doing so so thank you Brad for sharing some of that mm -hmm. but I'm wondering Brad now um, with that in mind would, would you pray for us pray for that ministry I would love to and uh, could be, just before yeah. I do could I just share one other thing yeah uh, with the good 360 ministry we've also been able to just in the last week uh, share with the East Lakes Women's and Children's Refuge and give them a whole heap of ladies' jumpers and other items. And they were over the moon because they had no support. And we've also got another opportunity, hopefully this coming week, with Nova Women's Care to give them items. Mm -hmm. So I've just wanted to remind people in the congregation, there's opportunities through Good360 that if you'd like to donate to that ministry where we can provide... Uh, toiletries, clothing, and other personal items to people in the community. So if you see a need, contact me 
and we may be able to help. Okay. Well, will you pray for us and pray for our church family as well? Love to. Thanks, Brad. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunities that you're bringing our way. And we see your hand at work and all that we're doing in the church. And we're just so blessed that even at this time, Lord, of this COVID-19 situation, Lord, where the needs are, are great and you're just expanding our opportunities, Lord, to show your love to the people in the community. And we thank you. We pray you continue to do that and, and help people to realise that this isn't, this isn't my ministry it isn't Phil's ministry. This is your ministry, the church's ministry. And you have a, an opportunity to sow into that ministry with prayer, with finances, with time, when, when the, the time is there. And so we, we ask, Lord God, for that big perspective, that God perspective, Lord, that we would see the needs. We would pray for our nation. We would pray for our community that we would do what is practically needed, Lord, in, as far as giving finances and our time to ministering your love to those within our church and in the broader community. So I do pray a blessing today over our people and I, I pray a blessing over our nation. I pray for your hand of protection over those who are in isolation, those who are unwell. I pray for protection over our nation and wisdom for our leaders. And I ask, Lord God, that you'd give each and every one of us God insight and God perspective uh, to be able to see the needs that are around us and take the opportunities to show the love of Christ. Amen. Amen. Uh, have sent you out an e a, um, a message outline for this morning and I trust that you might be able to use that uh, as we talk together this morning. This morning I want to um, start a new series. I've called it Trusting God in Difficult Times. I had planned a, another series as we started the transition to our new pastor coming in July but under the circumstances we all faced I decided uh, to change and look at the subject of trusting God. As Scott Morrison has said many times over the last month or so, 2020 will be the toughest year many of us have ever experienced. Life has changed as, as, as we know, as, as we have known, and it probably will never be the same again. 
We could add to the current situation the drought of many years, the incredible bushfires at the beginning of this year, which have seemed to have disappeared from the front page of our news coverage. Bring it closer to home. We're all struggling with change. There is change in work practices, change in the way we do school, changes in the way we do church. We cannot see people except on Zoom or FaceTime or some other platform. As I already mentioned, a couple of, of lost loved ones uh, or friends, and you've had to watch a funeral service online. All kinds of changes, and so many of them. I guess about the only thing we can predict accurately about the future is this. There will be change. Tomorrow will be different from today. Well, in some respects, maybe not much different. Uh, but we do know for certain that change is an, an, is an inevitable part of life. And we have to learn how to deal with it. The problem today is that the speed of change and the scope of change and the type of change and the size of change are all increasing. Things are changing faster than they used to. Economic forecasts will change over the next weeks, let alone months. Businesses will change. We've seen many, many changes. Even church has changed over recent years, let alone over the last couple of months. So today we will talk about how not to just to cope with change, but how to grow through change, how to be better, how to grow through it. So first of all, I want to talk about four things about change and then some principles from God's word on how to keep growing no matter what the changes in our life may be. And as I say, I encourage you to fill out the outline with these various points. So in respect to change, number one, change is inevitable. Change, nothing stays the same. On this planet, everything changes. God even told us that this was going to happen. Way back in the first book of the Bible in Genesis chapter 8, it says, as long as the earth remains, there's going to be springtime and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, day and night. We could say, if you like, God instituted change. Things don't stay the same. It gets hot, it gets cold. There's summer, there's winter. There are seasons in life. Things change. There's day and night every 24 hours. Change is inevitable. Here's a proverb. There's no growth without change. There's no change without loss. There's no loss without grief. And there's no grief without pain. Let me open that up for just a couple of moments. Firstly, there's no growth without change. If we are to grow spiritually, financially, relationally, intellectually, if we want our business to grow, if we want our church to grow, whatever it is, is going to have to change. A business cannot grow without change. There is no growth without change. Secondly, there is no change without loss. Every new beginning is an ending of something else, and every ending is a new beginning. That's what life's all about. Life is a series of endings and beginnings, graduations, commencements, commencements and so on. There is no change without loss. In some respects, uh, I want to suggest to you that life can be a bit like a trapeze artist. A trapeze artist who, who swings out on one bar uh, and then the other bar comes swinging in from the other direction and they grab hold of that second bar. They let go of one, the old one, to get the new one. But for a split second, they're holding on to absolutely nothing. Maybe that's where you are right now, hanging in midair. This is, that's a scary place to be. Maybe God's testing our faith. Will we let go and trust him? We can't expect to keep doing the same thing, old thing, uh, over and over again and get different results. Insanity, in fact, is doing the same thing year after year, month after month, but experiencing, expecting next year to be different. It won't be different unless we're different in terms of personal, in our personality, our growth and our development. Thirdly, there's no loss without grief. Grief is how we transition through the transitions of life because every end is a new beginning. We can't get to the next transition of life without grieving. Even Jesus grieved. He wept at his, at his friend's death. And there's no point stuffing grief down. It has to be let out. Now, one of the things about the male species is the male species, the men don't grieve very well. Because men are not always in touch with their emotions. Men often shove grief down. And that's like shaking up a can of Coke with the lid still on it. At some point, it's going to blow. If you don't grieve, it's going to come out sideways one way or another. I want to suggest that when someone loses a loved one, it's going to be at least a year of grief. It's a roller coaster and it's normal. That's the way life is. And let me also add, you never get over grief. 
you get through grief. It's a transition to the next stage of life. When people sadly say, well, hey, come on, aren't you over it yet? You say, no, I'm not over it and stop asking me about it. Because 10 years later, I still miss my husband. That's normal. That's okay. Grief is a good thing. It's a part of life. And yeah, you can be happy and grieve at the same time. For example, your child leaves home. Maybe that's a good thing. <laughs> You're happy for your child. Uh, maybe some of you are grieving because your kids haven't left home yet. But there can be a mixture of grief and happiness. There's no grief. There's no loss without grief. And then the last part of that proverb, there is no grief without pain. We all hate pain because it hurts. But pain tells us something is wrong. We all know if we didn't have pain, we would put our hand into a fire and burn it off and not know it. We'd lose our hand and never know it. Pain tells us something is wrong in our life. Relational pain says there's a problem in my relationships. So pain in many ways is a good thing because it has things to teach us. So change is inevitable. But secondly, not all change is good, but God can use it for our good. Losing a job is not good. Cancer is not good. But God can even use the bad things in our life for, for good, if we'll give them to him. Change comes from three sources. Change because of choices we make. Change is because of circumstances and change is because of consequences. Choices, circumstances and consequences. The easiest kind of change to handle are the, are the changes we choose to make ourselves. I'm going to move, I'm going to go to uni, I'm going to, I'm going to retire, I'm going to get married or whatever it is. They're the ones we choose to make and the easiest change to handle. The choices we make, either good or bad, they then have consequences and the consequences of life bring changes to our life. For example, there are consequences simply because we're human. There are things we can do and can't do. We live on an earth which is a broken planet, marred by sin, and everything's broken. Every relationship, nature, even our own body, nothing works perfectly. When other people make choices, there are consequences on our life. There are consequences of living in Australia compared to other countries. There are consequences of living in certain places compared to other places. There are circumstantial changes, which are the rogue winds, the earthquakes, the hurricanes of life, COVID-19. They just come out of the blue and we don't see them coming. We've got no control over it. How do we deal with it? Well, regardless of where change comes from, we have the promise of God. And this is, comes, this is a very famous verse that many of us know from Romans 8.28. We know that all, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And we've got to be careful of that verse, haven't we? God works for those who love God and are trying to follow his purpose or call according to his purpose. God says, even in your choices, even in the circumstances, even the consequences, good or bad, I will use them for good in your life. That's a promise. Thirdly, God's purpose for my life uses even the human error and sin. God knows that things are going to happen in our life and even before they happen. So he fits he fits it all into the plan and he uses pain. He even uses our mistakes, even uses our sin to inspect us and to correct us and direct us and to perfect us. He can use all of that for good if we've given him our life. And four, change is always a test, always a test of faith. When we go through any change, whether it's positive or negative, uh, marriage or divorce, death or birth, graduation or flunking out, it doesn't matter, change is always a test of our faith. Peter says to us, the Apostle Peter, in mean 1 Peter, the purpose of these troubles um, that you're going through is to test your faith as fire tests how genuine gold is. Your faith is much more precious than gold and by passing the test, it gives praise and glory and honour to God. So God says it's inevitable, but he says, I can use it all for good and I can even fit your plans and your errors and your mistakes and other people's sins into my plan. And I'm going to test your faith and strengthen it through you, strengthen you through it. So we have to learn to trust God in situations. So let's now look at some principles for growing through change. Uh, this is about changes we didn't ask for, that we don't like them, we don't want them. So the number one I want to suggest to you this morning is that we look for God 
uh, in the change. Look for God in the change that we are going through. When Mother Teresa was asked why she helped the poorest of the poor, this is what she said. She said this, because I see the face of Jesus in the poor and I want to help him. Even in the worst situations or in something that God created that's been perverted, we can look and see the original intent. We can see the face of Jesus around us. Jeremiah, if you look for me in earnest, you will find me when you seek me. Underline that word earnest. If you look for me in earnest, you will find me when you seek me. However, often when change comes, we look for everything except God. We look for a quick fix. We look for a way out. We look for comfort. We look for relief. But we need to be looking for God. And we'll get all these other things, the solution, the answer, the relief, the comfort, the strength and all that we need. So we look for God in the change. Secondly, we ask for wisdom. When we're going through a change that we didn't plan or want or like, we say, Lord, what do you want? me to do in this situation. My plan didn't work out. It's obviously not going the way I intended it. So what do you want me to do? How do you, how do you want to redirect me? How do, how do you want to correct me? How do you want to inspect me? How do you want to perfect me in this situation? So we need to ask for wisdom because in the change, our thinking's got to change. To do what we've never done, we've got to think like we've never thought. The old way of thinking won't work because it's a new situation, a new thing, a new relationship, a, a new energy, a new development, a new commitment, a new circumstance. So we've got to think in new ways. And COVID-19 has certainly caused lots of new thinking. So we say, Lord, what do you want me to think? And James is the verse. If you need wisdom, if you want to know what God wants you to do, ask him and he'll gladly tell you he will not resent you asking. Jesus said, you have not because you ask not. You need to, we need to stop and say, Lord, what do you want me to do in this situation? So that leads me to number three, listening for God's voice. And to do that, we need to be quiet because usually God doesn't shout. God speaks to those who take time to listen. And often the brightest insights will often come during our darkest days as we listen to God in quiet trust. But if we're listening to everything else around us, we're not going to get those insights. And of course, one of the greatest examples is is the encounter in 1 Kings 19, the story of Elijah. Elijah was up on the mountains nursing his wounds, having a pity party, hiding in a cave, and God needs to get, to get his attention. And the scriptures say this, The Lord passed by and sent a furious wind that split the hills and shattered the rocks, but the Lord was not in the wind. Then there was an earthquake, but the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. Then after that there was a fire, but the Lord wasn't in the fire. Then after the fire, there was a soft whisper of a voice. When Elijah heard it, he covered his face with his cloak and went out and he stood in the entrance of the cave and the voice said to him, Elijah, what are you doing here? I wonder, has God ever said that to you? <laughs> what are you doing here? How did you end up here? Uh, I didn't plan for you to end up here. I, I don't want you here. I mean, hanging out in a cave in a mountain saying, poor me, everybody hates me, nobody loves me, I'm going to eat worms. Having a little pity party for yourself, are you? No, God sometimes speaks in the still, small voice, a whisper. So when change is happening, we need to slow down our mind. So we look for God in the change, we ask God for wisdom and we listen for God's whisper. And then in that questioning, we don't ask why, but we ask what? What do I need to learn? Why is the question of explanation? What is the question of education? Every situation we have is an opportunity to grow and we'll either grow better or we'll grow bitter, depending on our response. So we need to focus not on the circumstances, but on our character. Don't focus on the problem, focus on our personality. Don't focus on what's going on around us, but on what God wants to do in us. That's the difference. I mean, God's number one purpose for us is character development. To make us like, more like Christ and to grow us up, to develop true spiritual maturity and character. So sometimes he allows circumstances that teach us things in the school of hard knocks. Some things we only learn through difficulty or through experience. And I've said before, we don't take anything to heaven other than our character. What we are, what we become. God's far more interested in what's happening in us 
than what's happening around us. So when things are happening around us, we're going to either resent it or grow from it. And we've got to decide. Will we be a victim or a victor? Victims whinge and whine. A winner will say, Lord, what do you want me to learn from this situation? So we don't ask why, we ask what. God doesn't owe us any explanations for everything that happens in life. In fact, we're never going to get it anyway. I mean, if we had an explanation for everything, we, we wouldn't need faith. Some things that happen in our life won't be explained until we get to heaven. And when we get to heaven, we're going to see the whole picture from beginning to, under, to, beginning to end and we'll understand. So what do we need to learn in life? There are lots of things we need to learn in character. And, and we haven't got time to tackle that here now. But the Bible gives us enough evidence that these things don't come naturally, uh, that we have to learn them. Uh, and learning suggests some hard work which we don't like. Character doesn't come naturally. We have to learn things. That's what we call spiritual development, spiritual maturity. That's why God says, I'm going to use it all to teach you. And Romans says to us, Paul says to us, even in our trials, even in our troubles, these very things will develop mature character. The trial, the problem, the circumstance, the change we're going through right now, God wants to grow us up to develop and mature our character. I mean, let's be honest. Life's hard. It's difficult. It's tough. It's not easy. This is not heaven. This is earth. This is the testing school. This is the, this is testing. This is the trial period. This is the warm-up act. And, and wherever there's sin, there's going to be problems. Even after becoming a Christian, life is a struggle. And that's because God wants to change us and sometimes we don't want to change. We'd rather do our own deal, our own thing and be selfish and self-centered. We want our plans and our agenda. We don't want to go with God's plans and that's the struggle. And that's one reason the Bible advises us to give thanks in all circumstances. It doesn't say for all circumstances, but in. We don't give thanks for loss of job or cancer or assault or murder or COVID-19, whatever but in the circumstances that God is in control, that God loves us, that he'll help us out, he'll give us strength, he'll use everything for good in our life. There's all kinds of promises and the things we're thankful for in the circumstances, and that's how we grow. I don't like this, whatever the this is, but I'm going to give thanks in the circumstances because I know God loves me, he cares for me, and all these other things that we can be thankful for. I'm still breathing, I'm still alive. Number five, when you're facing a major change, focus on what never changes. Don't focus on the situation, focus on what never changes. What never changes, three things. God's love will never change. God's promises, his word is always true. And God's purpose for our life will never change. A couple of verses on the screen. Jeremiah, I've loved you with an everlasting love. Psalms, his plans endure for how long? Forever. His purposes last how long? Eternally. Another one, the word of God shall stand forever. God's love, God's truth, God's purposes for our life will never ever change. That's what we focus on when things are flying through the air and we don't understand it all. Next one I want to suggest to you is don't face it alone. Accept help from others, which is the opposite to human nature. Our tendency when we're in pain is to pull into our shell, we retreat in fear into our own castle. But that won't get us through the change. And that's not how we grow through change. We need each other. We need other people to help us through. We don't have to tell everybody, but we need a few close friends around us. You might say, but hang on, I don't want anybody else to know. Well, <laughs> the word for that is pride, ego, arrogance. And we know the Bible says God resists the proud. Uh, that means that person's on the opposite side of God every time we get full of pride. But it says God gives grace to the what? To the humble. So what we need to get through this difficult time is God's grace. And we do that by humbling ourselves. Currently, obviously, we cannot be in life groups, but we can still contact each other. Everyone has a phone. Some people get under a lot of stress because they've got no one to share with and they bottle it up inside, always tired because of the stress, bordering on depression sometimes because all that stuff being kept inside. You know, something like 51 times in the Bible, 
There is the command to love one another, bear one another's burdens, care for one another, pray for one another, share with one another, all the one another's. Ecclesiastes, two are better, than, are better off than one. If one of them falls down, the other can help him up. Two men can resist an attack that would defeat one man alone. You know, God has wired us up in such a way that we need each other. No person is an island. A burden that is shared is halved and a joy that is shared is double. Next one I suggest to you is we become a promised person or a promised promise people. What we mean here is build our life on the promises of God and that will allow us to stand enormous levels of stress. There are what, over 7,000 promises in the Bible all waiting to be claimed. They're like a blank check where God says, if you do this, I'll do this. If you do that, I'll do that. God says, I'm not going to ever give up on you. What I started in your life, I'm going to complete. In Philippians, Paul says in Philippians, I'm sure of this, that God who began this good work in you will carry it on until it's finished, until the day of Jesus Christ. What God starts, he finishes in our life. God did not bring us this far to leave us where we are. The story is not finished. The last chapter has not been written yet. You're, you're still in the middle of the movie, if you like. He says, what I started in your life, I'm going to complete if you let me do it. So Peter says to us, hey, you can throw the whole weight of your anxiety on him for you are his personal concern. We are God's personal concern. All that stress and worry and anxiety and insecurity, just dump it on me, says God. And of course, Paul says in Philippians, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And we get that peace by trusting God in the circumstances we may not and we do not understand. When we say to God, God, I don't get this. I don't understand it. It stinks. I, I don't like what's going on right now, but I'm going to trust you. Then the peace that transcends, transcends understanding comes because instead of looking for an explanation, we get the strength and that strength comes from God. Psalmist says the righteous man does not need to fear bad news, nor live in dread of what may happen. For he has settled in his mind that God will take care of him. That means our happiness does not depend on the surrounding circumstances because we've settled in our mind that God is going to take care of us. And the final step, the final point, I'll tell God I'll trust him no matter what. It may not be a storybook ending. It may not turn out the way we want it to turn out. But we say we will trust God no matter what because God is a good God. He loves us. He made us. He knows what's best for us. He created us. He has a plan for our life. Remember Job, Job in the Old Testament who lost everything in life. This is what he said. He said, though he, God, slay me, yet will I trust him. God, even if this is the end of the road, even if I don't live another day, even if I don't make it, God, I'm going to trust you. And if you decide to take my life right now, if, if it's over, I'm still going to trust you because I still have heaven to look forward to. That's the ultimate test of faith. And that's hard to say. Isn't it? A loved one is very ill. You're struggling with work and being persecuted for standing up for what is right. Or it's COVID-19 with all the different pressures. Or it's whatever. God, I'm going to trust you. No matter what happens. I don't, I don't care, good or bad. No matter what happens, I'm going to trust you. That's hard to say. I will still serve you. Um... To say, God, you know what's best because you're a good God. You give and you take away. You know what's best and you have a plan. I don't understand that plan. And although I'm going through pain right now and difficulties, I'm going to trust you no matter what. A great stress reliever is to hold everything God gives us with an open hand. Anything we grab onto is going to kill us. Anything we grab onto is going to stress us out. Because why? It becomes an idol. Even good things can become an idol. The Ten Commandments say, have no other gods, have no idols. But anything we grasp hold on to we, and we can't hold it with an open hand is an idol. If God gives us something in our life and 
we couldn't give it up. We don't own it, it owns you. You need to hold it with an open hand. God can put one job in your hand. He can easily put another job in your hand. If he turns on one tap, he can turn off another. If he turns one off, he can turn on another. If he closes one window, he can open another window. If he closes one door, he can open up another door. We belong to him. We come to the point of maturity when we say, my identity is not in my job or not in my relationships or not in my wealth. My identity is in Jesus Christ. That can never be taken away. Then we can say like Job did of old, the song that sometimes we sing, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And would you join me in prayer, please? Maybe you need to be praying something like this this morning. Dear God, I realise there's no growth without change, no change without loss, no loss without grief, and no pain without, no grief without pain. But God, I thank you that in all things you're working for good in my life. Even when people intend to harm me, you mean it for good. I thank you that the purpose of what I'm going through right now is to test my faith. So God, I want to look for you in the change. I want to seek you. Not a solution, not a quick fix, not a way out. I want to ask you for wisdom, so please give us your wisdom. Forgive us when we might be too busy and too noisy to hear your whisper. Help us to stop asking why and to start asking what do you want us to learn. Help me to give thanks in all circumstances, not for them but in them, because that's your will. Develop mature character in me and grow me up. Help me focus on that which never changes, your love for me, your purpose and your promises. And therefore forgive me for my pride. Father, you've told me you don't want me to face this alone, so help me open up to some friends. Help me to share with a few people what's happening so that they can share those burdens with me. And then I want to become a promised purpose person. Now, thank you that you who began a good work in my, in our, my life, you're going to finish what you started and the story is not finished. What you start, you complete. That you'll have the last word and your word is good. Is good. And I want to throw all my anxiety on you right now. And thank you that I am your personal concern. I want to be a godly man. I want to be a godly woman. And so, Father, I want to thank you. I want to say to you today that no matter what happens, I'll trust you. No matter what the ending is, I'll trust you. Because you're a good God. And if you've never invited Jesus into your life, you can simply do that right now and ask him to be the manager of your life and telling him that you want to trust you and and, not, and love you. And so, Father, hear our prayer. Our prayer for ourselves and our prayer for others, particularly in this time of isolation and uncertainty. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. May God bless you. of the Lord, the Holy One is here. Come bow before Him now with reverence and fear. of the Lord, the Holy One is
for the 